Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Seek and Destroy, and this is going to be a fan podcast uh, where you're going to watch a movie today. And when I say we, I don't talk. I'm not talking about just myself like I normally do when I do my Venom show. I actually have a friend here, uh, my friend Alex Wilson. Alex, say hello to everybody. Hey, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> Feel free to respond out loud. Yes, we can hear you even in the past when we're recording this. Um, yeah, that's how time works. That's exactly how ears work. Um, yeah, so we are, it just, Alex had this fun idea to, uh, earlier on the phone, I've obviously, I've been going through a miserable time lately with hypothermia and, uh, Alex was like, Hey, do you want to watch a movie together tonight? And I said, sure. Which one? And he's like, I don't know, like one of those terrible Batman ones. And I was like, yes, of course I do. And so, uh, we were making, what was that? Oh, I was saying because my friend Gene was making fun of me. Uh, and calling me Mr. Freeze, Mr. Freeze, right? Because my because uh, my hypothermia, and uh, and you said, oh, we should watch that movie. <laughs> so I'm um, I'm glad you connected dots in that in that way, and uh, and now here we are. So if you are out there, please get Batman and Robin ready. We are paused on the Warner Brother logo right when the movie starts, and we're gonna start it here in one second. But uh, I just want to thank Alex for being here today and taking time out of his life to watch this terrible movie with movie uh, with me from across the country thank you alex yeah take taking time out of my uh life of sitting on the couch which is what i would have been doing just without you i was gonna say you're, are you not sitting on the couch now watching this yeah i mean i, I would just have been doing it alone and basically <laughs> i would have been watching this movie by myself if i wasn't watching it with you and let me tell you out there friends if you haven't seen batman and robin watch it with a friend it's quite the experience. It makes it way more fun. <laughs> it sure does. Um, so, uh, so yeah, Alex, are you ready to go? Yeah, I am ready to go. All right, so it, I'm going to do a countdown. We're going to go three, two, one, and then play, all right? All right. All right, everyone out there, join us and get Batman and Robin ready. And that is, of course, the Batman and Robin movie starring George Clooney as Batman, uh, directed by the late, great Joel Schumacher, who just recently passed away, RIP. And we'll get into all that when we watch the movie. So here we go. Three... Two, one, play. Um, and just to, to note, as this movie's starting, um, we're recording all this in one straight shot, hopefully, without any interruptions. Um, the logo just turned to ice, by the way, the Batman logo. That's where I am as well. Awesome. And, uh, and you know, there, if, if there's any audio drift to where the movie, like our recording, doesn't sync up with the exact link of the movie... That does happen from time to time, but we're doing the best we can. Hopefully you can still listen to us as a podcast if you want. George? It's interesting how like all the effects have changed through the years, like seeing all these title sequences. Yeah. Um, and this, uh, I can't remember who does the score on this one, uh, but uh, yes, like they, this is so fun. Like this, like this bat signal coming in and then the Nightwing symbol coming in. Um, which it's not, it, it, it is a Robin in the context of this movie, but it is a, technically the Nightwing symbol. It's funny when people say, this is our first on-screen Nightwing. I'm like, no, Batman and Robin was the first on-screen Nightwing, even though they called him Robin. Nipples! Yeah, the, all the butts too. Yeah, the, oh the yeah. The cod pieces. Yep, you get close up on those cods. So, what do you know about the making of this movie, Alex? Man, I know it's it's sort of like I really don't know much. I guess I would say I only have uh, half thought out rumors in my head. Okay, here's your here's a DCU reference here. Um, oh, because Batman's on the screen? No. <laughs> yes, that that gives it away. That that's how you know it's a DC movie. Um, no, they're going to reference another superhero from the DC universe right off the bat. If you did this in modern day, people would go, oh my God, it's a shared universe. I love it. Um, what do you think of the Batmobile? Oh, oh snap. He they, said Superman. He knows Superman. Um, this Batmobile is hilarious because, if I'm not mistaken, 
um, I tried to win this Batmobile. They were given they were given away the movie car as a giveaway for Taco Bell. Wait, so Batman's driving away. Where's Robin? Well, ne- see, now he has to wait for his bike to show up. They can't leave at the same time. They don't have they don't have a two car garage. <laughs> they, this is I think this is a subliminal way of them setting up the tension between Batman and Robin in this movie um where where Robin keeps complaining that it's Batman first then Robin and that they're not partners so I'm like well you just illustrated that with the opening of this movie so good on you I guess um also some foreshadowing there cuz all the only good scenes in this movie sadly are when when um Alfred is sick like, it's kind of an interesting story to have Alfred sick. I, I do like that aspect of it. I've but, always thought it would be like cool to have a Batman story where Alfred gets Alzheimer's, so he's like slowly kind of fading away. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, this isn't those scenes are and what I mean by those are the best scenes in movies. Those are the best acted scenes because you have George Clooney and Pat Hingle, literally just emotionally connecting as Bruce and, and Alfred and those are really the only good scenes in this movie in my opinion. <laughs> so here's my favorite thing. Batman just 10 seconds ago learned about Mr. Freeze. He's like, hey, it's like all in exposition happened off screen. Like, hey, there's a new villain in town. He calls himself Mr. Freeze. And then yet Batman's going to show up with all the gear needed to fight a guy who has ice powers. Because Batman's prepared for everything. <laughs> this movie it illustrates that big time. I do like the freeze the effects. The outfits are funny. Yeah, but yeah, they are. are. Those Mad Maxi. Right. Yeah, Mad Maxi with like um, like a hockey pad kind of um, like lining to it. Yeah, it's like all the money went into Mister Freeze's suit, and he didn't have any money left over for henchmen. Yeah, what do you think like, of uh, Mr. Freeze's suit? Go to the thrift store. Get some, get some protective gear. What do you think of Mr. Freeze's suit? I kind of like it. it. It reminds me of... Um, what's that game? Maybe Crisis? Yeah. You remember that video game, that first-person shooter? Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, Crisis to a little bit. Or even like a Titan from Destiny. Okay, okay. Um, here's an interesting thing about Mr. Freeze's arms. If you look closely at where his arms bend underneath the armor, you can see like this, um, insulation type looking stuff, like where it's like a layered, um, almost like a insulation pipe in a way. Um, or what's the, um, um, like where, you know, where you'll, if you know, when you get one of those portable ACE units and you have those big tubes that unravel to like flow the air. Oh, yeah, yeah, like the, I don't know, like the vent or yeah. the exhaust pipe. Or... Yeah, yeah, like those, but like the the, the foldable ones. Um, that's underneath his armor. You can see it on right there on, on, on his armpits. That is actually... Oh, kind of like an accordion? Yes. Um, yes, like an accordion. Um, that is uh, on inspired by the Batman or the Mr. Freeze design from the Adam West TV show. Oh, interesting. Because uh, he had those on his arms in the Adam West show. Um, and if you <clears throat> listen to this movie with the actual commentary by uh, um, Joel Schumacher, it's one of the best commentary tracks I've ever listened to, ever. Really? Yeah, because he actually... What wa- makes it so good? Does he just have like lots of fun facts? Does he talk about the nipple design a lot? He he does uh, a little bit. He talks a lot about. Uh, his, I love the oh, ice they skates. Got the <laughs> they, they're ready. I got ice skates. Let's fight them. And then they got hockey sticks and everything. Like, it's hilarious. It's like they just heard about this guy ten seconds ago. Um. <laughs> and this is the most effective way to deal with a diamond. No one's picked it up yet. <laughs> right. Um, this is also very effective. I like this. He's like, I need my gun. Oh, there we go. 
throw a person. <laughs> he just, I actually like that for comedic beat. I like it. I don't think it fits in this for a Batman movie technically, but, uh, or specifically, but yeah. Um, but if you listen to Joe Schumacher talk about this movie, he says when he made Batman Forever, the studio, who originally Batman Forever was going to be directed by Tim Burton, um, and he had plans for Harvey Dent, because Harvey Dent was played by Billy D. Williams in the first Batman movie. Oh, I got to pause for that line. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age. Um, but he wanted to do a, you know, a black Two-Face, and when his face gets burned, it burns down to the white meat. That was kind of his idea. And they, oh, that's interesting. Okay. And they said, no way, it's too dark, we're not going to let you do your version of the movie. So they kind of wedged him out, kind of like they did recently with jo uh, with Zack Snyder. Warner Brothers kind of wedged Tim Burton out, and then they brought in Joel Schumacher. And, jo and they said, make a lighter movie so we can sell lunchboxes and all this, because apparently there were kids who had nightmares watching Batman Returns. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and then like New York Times or someone, they hi they literally hired a kid to review Batman and Robin on like the late night show. And he said that it's the movie scared him. And after that happened, they were getting all this bad publicity. Batman wasn't for kids anymore. He was too dark. And they were like, okay, we got to lighten this up. So they brought in Joel Schumacher and he decided, well, if you look at the two Tim Burton movies, they're kind of very eighties influence from the comics, like Frank Miller. And then, so he's like, all right, well, I'm yeah. going to make Batman forever influenced by the seventies. And so that was kind of his visual design for the third third movie, Batman Forever. And then with this one, he wanted to make a movie that was a nod to the Adam West show. The problem is, is most of the audience had grown up from the Adam West show and they wanted more darker stuff. But he says when he made this movie, he's like, actually, the script was really good. He said it had very human moments in it. It, had, it dealt a lot about with, you know, losing a friend like Alfred being sick. He said there was really good themes written by Akiva Goldsmith, who's actually an Academy Award winning writer for movies like, um, uh, what's that movie with Russell Crowe where he has like uh, The Beautiful Mind? Um, okay. So Akiva Goldsmith wrote that and won an Academy Award for it. He also wrote this movie. And Joel Schumacher says, in the, he goes, if you don't like this movie, don't blame Akiva Goldsmith. Don't blame the actors. Don't blame anyone. Just blame me. I'm the, it's my fault. <laughs> he takes full responsibility. <laughs> and I, I actually really like that because I'm like, I don't think any director would ever do that nowadays. I mean, yeah, it is kind of weird. Like, everyone does try to blame everyone else for the process of, of movies. Like, like we were talking about this earlier today before, before watching this, that um, we both don't think uh, the sound design in Christopher Nolan movies is particularly good, but he defends his sound design saying, oh, it's not me, it's the audience. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like, And even, like, Zack Snyder, when, when uh, people were like, hey, your movies didn't make as much money as they should have and you know warner brothers they don't like that and he's like well sorry that some people out there don't like my version you know it's it's like okay dude you can't you can't blame others <laughs> like like i get it i mean you yeah, can like, sure but but you can't blame the consumer for not liking the product like it's like if someone made a a, a crappy restaurant and then were upset that no one ate there and it's like well do you understand why people don't eat there Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, maybe the food's bad. And uh, or to, to most people, I mean, hey, and yeah, most people have gutter palates. So if you're making like a fine, you know, restaurant meal and they don't like it, it's like, OK, maybe sure there might be reasons why they don't like your stuff, but you can't like throw the blame on them. You know, it's like, yeah, hey, you can't say, oh, I'm not profitable. It's not my fault. It's the consumer in general fault. <laughs> well, I also like the idea of that. It's like Superman has been around 80 years and it's like, oh, well, it's the audience's fault if they only know one type of Superman. It's like, no, it isn't. <laughs> That's like the zeitgeist. Most people see Superman a certain way. I get that you yeah, want to... everyone's got like their own Superman sort of uh, interpretation. Sure. So, so I understand you have a type that you're doing, but you have to understand that that type is not going to go over well with like 80% of the people that have their type. Yeah, you get some people who have seen, like, Superman through the lens of, like, the Christopher Reeves movies, or some, like, people who grew up with Superman Returns, or, or people who have read the comics or not read the comics. There's, like, so many interpretations of these characters in people's heads. 
It's true. Um, what do you think of the scene here? Robin just saved Batman, and now they're just falling from the sky like like psychopaths. They're like surfing down a city. <laughs> and Mr. Freeze has wings. Like, how, did he know he was going to need wings in this battle? They look like butterfly wings, kinda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is great I'm too. Surprised, honestly, at like how well the effects kind of do hold up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where I'm like, oh, it doesn't. It doesn't look as cheesy as I would have expected it to. No, it's because they they did a lot with um, miniatures. So it's even if they were on green screen, like falling, the background is a miniature and not a CG effect. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that makes it a lot better. Right. So it adds like texture to the background, so they don't look fake. Yeah, it's a little more. Um, there's a lot of more practical effects in here than I think most people would anticipate for the time. Do you know anything about the soundtrack to this movie? No, I don't really know anything about the soundtrack to this movie. The, um... Oh, here's Robin going in half-cocked. Um... The... Now he's a frozen mess. Why would he hold the the diamond and dive to attack? (laughs) Hey, shut your mouth. Um... He's like, the thing you want, I'm gonna hit you with it. (laughs) This is the one thing I, I do like they do in this movie, and I'm sure it would have read better if the movie wasn't so goofy, um, which is what he said to him right there. He's like, Batman, can you be cold? Can you leave your partner to die to stop me? I think there's this impression people have that Batman is such a loner and he's such a prick to his Batman family that, sure, he would probably never go that far. He'd probably always save them, but there is that debate what, that people have. And what I like is this movie kind of deals with that um, because Batman wasn't known to be like that too much in the comic books. He was he was very family oriented a lot of times. Um, this movie actually deals with actual tension between him and Robin and whether he's a good mentor or not. And I, I kind of like that, even though it's a they do it in a hammy way in this movie. I, I do like that concept. Um, and I also do like a. Chris O'Donnell as, as Robin. Um, so before... I really like the color palette in this movie. It's just so distinct and so uh, over the top. Yes. Um, so real quick, the soundtrack of this movie, the main theme song for this movie was by Smashing Pumpkins. Um, oh, really? And it was at the height of their success in the late 90s. And they do two songs. Uh, the beginning of the end of the beginning and the end of the beginning of the end. And it's pretty much the same song, slightly different lyrics at different tempos. So one's really fast and one's really slow. And the slow one was used in Zack Snyder's Watchmen trailer for when that movie was coming out, which is pretty interesting. Um, Oh, that is interesting. And it's mainly used because Warner Brothers owns the song. So (laughs) So it's easy for them. Yeah, they're just like, pull from the library, reference something. (laughs) What do you think of uh, the... So we're going to introduce our villains now. We have Mr. Freeze already. This is our other villain, uh, Poison Ivy. I know we're going to get into it more, but uh, it says Project Gilgamesh, which is actually from the comic books um, about the creation of Bane. And this is Pamela Isley, and we're going to meet Jason Woodrow, um, played by John Glover. And he's the he played Lex Luthor's dad on Smallville. Um, he was Lionel Luthor. And he plays Jason Woodrow, who's actually a character from the comic books known as um, the Philonic Man, I think, like the Plant Man, essentially. Uh, What do you think of these villains? You know, I kind of think it's it's goofy, but it's... uh, It's sort of goofy in that, like, overdramatic, melodramatic way that makes it kind of fun. So I guess for me, looking back on this, this is a cool kind of nostalgia. Sure, sure, sure. Venom. (laughs) Straight from the comics. Um, I agree with you on the color palette of this movie. It's very interesting. It's it's definitely overused, but you're right. It gives the movie... People don't forget this movie, even if they hate it. 
they they remember how bright and silly this movie is and uh, you know so i guess joel schumacher did something right part of it uh almost feels more like a stage production than a movie yes yeah it does you're right like this feels like, like it if could you were happen. To make a Batman play, right? You would use this sort of set and and sort of color tones and things like that. It's funny you say that because they actually did do a live action Batman play type thing about seven years ago. A friend of mine she took me to see it in L.A. and this is exactly the color palette they used for the live action show of Batman. I mean, it, it makes sense. It's it's it really does feel like. Like the, like these guys are stand like those uh, the, the like Saudi prince and the African prince and right. those soldier guys they're all standing on a balcony overlooking a scene like it just seems how you would set up a play right yeah you're right well it translated well to to stage and uh, and here we have the origin of Bane um, it's funny when people say like oh. You know, comic book movies nowadays are so terrible and they don't get the origins right or whatever. It's like, this has most of the elements that are accurate to Bane's origin, but Bane is just not really a character in this movie. Um, yeah, he's more of just like a, a, a monster or a force or a tool. He doesn't have some any sort of arc, I would guess. No. No. Um, he's played by Jeep Swenson, who also passed away. Um, R.I.P. Jeep. And, uh... And it's funny, they show, um... They actually show humanity and Pamela Isley here. Um, where it's like, oh, she's upset that people are being experimented on and all this other stuff. But then you find out she's actually really upset that her plants are being used to do it. Um... And I, I kind of like that. Like her, her anger is misguided. It's, she's not upset that a human's being experiment, experimented on. She's upset that her plants are used to experiment on the human. <laughs> yeah, she's like, how dare you use my work for something nefarious instead of how dare you do something nefarious. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, she's like, how dare you involve me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so over the top uh it is it, it's like a play yeah 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 it's it's amazing um and it's funny because there are parallels to poison ivy and mr freeze they both were kind of screwed over by their partners uh, in their projects uh, in this case, obviously, Woodrow, uh, Jason Woodrow here. And then um, I can't remember Decker or something like that. I can't remember the, the guy who screwed over Mr. Freeze and his lab experiment. But they're both kind of screwed over, so there's a parallel. And, the, and at their core, they both mean to do well. Like Poison Ivy's kind of, in a way, an environmentalist and cares about plants. And Mr. Freeze cares about a human. He cares about his wife. Um and here we get his origin here. In certain respects, they, uh, they hold some parallels also to uh, another favorite character of mine, the Punisher. Yeah. Where you're, you're doing something out of a nobility, but you're doing it in a very misguided way that's causing more damage than good. Right. Yeah. It's not like, like the Joker is just a maniac, and they want the Joker wants chaos for chaos, but these people have... Uh, surprisingly similar motivations right yeah this is the joke uh gene made to me before where he said uh seek if you're cold why don't you just get some diamonds to warm you <laughs> <laughs> i'm like well diamonds don't warm up mr freeze they just power a suit i like this too is alfred every time they cut to him he's he's clearly in pain uh, he's he's trying to hide something, and what I like is that it never happens in Batman's uh, viewpoint. He can't see it, but yet when the truth comes out yeah, later, he hides it from, from Bruce Wayne. Right, he doesn't want to show Bruce that he's he doesn't you know he's he's worried about Bruce emotionally, and I what I like is that Bruce 
knows it's happening anyway. Like, that's very Batman of him. He's like, later when they go, yeah, I'm sick, and he, Batman's, or Bruce goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but this scene here, like, anytime these two are together, it's, I really like it. I, I gotta be honest with you. I think George Clooney might be one of my favorite Bruce Waynes. Um, I, I really what like that. What do you the, like about him as a Bruce Wayne? Yeah, like I can see why he was cast. Like, because uh, I know a lot of people, he got cast for this after he did um, From Dust Till Dawn. And I know a lot of people were like, ooh, he's gonna be so good as Batman because he's great as uh, the, one of the Gecko brothers in From Dust Till Dawn. And it's like, but I'm glad he brought something different to this table. Like, he, his, the way he portrays Bat or Bruce Wayne in this, not Batman, but the way he portrays Bruce Wayne in this, where he's like, he sometimes has a smile on his face and he's kind of stuck in his own memories and he's got like salt and pepper hair. He's getting older. I, I just, I don't know. I, when I think of Bruce Wayne a lot of times, I think of his mannerisms. Yeah, I can, I can see that. That's the, that's the challenge of being like an actor cast as Batman where, you're not only playing Batman, you're you're really also going to have to play Bruce Wayne. Right. I mean, probably except for Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck didn't really have any Bruce Wayne scenes. Uh, uh, he had some. He had some. But they were but mostly he was terrible. Well, mostly his Bruce Wayne scenes were just him as Batman without the costume on. Yeah, I mean, but he was still like interacting with like Wonder Woman or something. It's not like he right. was going to it's not like he did the same things like Christian Bale, where Christian Bale would go out on the town and, and the girls he's with would, like, play in fountains and he would drive fancy cars and all that. You know what I'm talking about? True. Like, he... I feel like when you're, when you're cast as Batman, you need to not only play Batman, that kind of gruff, dark character, but you also need to play the alter ego, and it's, it's such a hard, I think, contrast to make. It can. That like you know obviously Christian Bale with the voice change, um, yeah. George Clooney does not do the voice change. He sounds pretty much the same um, as both Bruce Wayne and Batman, but that's why I don't really like his Batman too much. But I do like his Bruce Wayne a lot. Um, oh yeah, I like this line. But yeah, that that that's the interesting thing. <laughs> it's she's totally chewing up the scenery, but I love it. She reminds me of, a, or she doesn't remind me, I guess I should say, um, Kate Blanchett reminds me of her when Kate played um, Hela in Thor Ragnarok. Oh, I could see that. Yeah, she, I felt like she was channeling her inner uh, Poison Ivy uh, from, from Uma Thurman here. She's just like really chewing the scenery and just like hamming it up. And I love that. That's stock footage from earlier. <laughs> they didn't shoot Bane. Like, put in it the, in there. Yeah, they didn't shoot Bane at a new angle. It was like they were editing and they were like, oh, right, Bane's here. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> well, like, look at this. This is, this is clearly what you would come up with if you were making a, a, a stage production. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Um,. Like, look, they have a full, like, henchman job, this would be. Yeah. Oh, we got Vivica Fox here. Is even her cigar frozen? Yes. <laughs> smoke a cigar if he needs to stay cold. It, I know, it's, <laughs> I know. It's like some art department person had to figure out, all right, we got to make a paper that looks frozen and wrap it around a, a working cigar. 
Yeah. This was something that they did a lot with the Batman movies. They try to treat them like James Bond movies. So they would always give the bad guys hench women. I think Two Face had two hench women, and one of them was um, Drew Barrymore in Batman Forever. Um, and now he's got Vivica Fox in this one, but she literally only has like two scenes in this movie. Yeah, like I don't remember. I've seen this movie like once or twice before, uh, but I don't remember her. Right. Yeah. This uh, this plot that he ha- that he's developing here, where it's like a coming up with a, f- a freezing device to freeze the city i believe yeah. i believe that is his storyline that's going to be in the upcoming gotham knights multiplayer video game oh uh, really that's kind of interesting yeah yeah because i saw the the trailer for it and it was like batgirl and robin are like trying to stop him and uh I, the, the new game looks fun it's it's an open world ish gotham city and it's four player and you can do two player co-op on it um Oh, God, that's so cool. Yeah. Like, that's really the coolest thing is I, I want, like, open-world co-op games. That sounds like a ton of fun. Like, you playing as Robin and me playing as, like, I don't know, Batgirl or something. Yeah. And we get to hang out and, I don't know, go go on adventures in, like, a, like a player-versus-environment situation. That sounds cool. Yeah, it, it looks pretty fun. Like, I, I'll be honest, I did a trailer reaction to it, and I'm... I'm really looking forward to it. It comes out early next year, and I think on next-gen consoles and current consoles. Um, so if, if it does, we should we should get it and play it. Cause, um, you can, so the storyline in the game is Batman is missing or presumed dead, and the Court of Owls yeah. have taken over Gotham. And so, oh, it's a Court of Owls story. Okay. Yeah, but Mr. Freeze is like a part of their plan, uh, like he is in the comics. He's the one who develops their cryotechnology. Um, so you have... Uh, Robin, uh, who is Tim Drake. Um, you have Batgirl, uh, who looks like the Burnside design, which is great. Because um, that's the best design of it Batgirl. Re- it really is. <laughs> I've been a Batgirl Brad fan. Potter did such an amazing job. Those boots she gives her is super cool. Like it's such a a cool, practical outfit that still really keeps true. I think to like the Batman vibe. Right. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm a, a Batgirl fan of like 30 years and. I still say that the bat, the Burnside design is the best design they've ever done. Um, oh yeah, I, I, I even bought like I think I was with you at Golden Apple when I bought a statue because I was like looking yeah. at it and they were like, "Oh, you know, seek take twenty percent off if you want," and I was like, "Okay, I'll buy it." That's oh, that's awesome. Well, don't spread that if you're out there. Uh, my name does not always get you twenty percent off at Golden Apple Comics. No, I was there <laughs> with him. He has to be with you for those discounts to uh, yeah. apply. Yeah, and that's not possible right now. So. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's not in California, so to get 20% off, you'd have to fly him out, which I think would, would you'd probably break even. Pretty much. Um, and then the other characters in the game you can play as are Nightwing and Red Hood, obviously. Um, but speaking of Batgirl, we, we have... Is it, is it, is it Damien uh, Wayne Bat Robin? No, it's Tim Drake Robin. So it's Tim Drake Robin, and then uh, Nightwing, and then um, Red Hood, and, and Burnside Batgirl. Yep. That's kind of a weird mashup. What are you talking about? That's pretty stand. Well, that's how it was for years before Damien came in. I guess so. I just like Damien a lot. I'd like to see Damien. Yeah. He's a I'm, ninja. Yeah, it's true. But I, I, I'm, I like seeing Tim Drake get some love, because ever since Damien came in, Tim Drake has not gotten any love. Um I guess that's true. I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a Damien generation. You're a Tim Drake generation. It's just one of those <laughs> dividing differences in our friendship. <laughs> well, I'm a Jason Todd generation. The only problem is, is he died right after I became a fan of him. Um, so then I had to become a Tim Drake fan. Although I like Tim Drake, though he's a good character. Um, See, you're a fan. Yeah, I like him. I, but I like Damien too. Um. So this is a very different version of Batgirl for this movie. Alicia Silverstone plays someone who's related to Alfred, which is obviously not comic book accurate. Yeah, because she's uh, Gordon's daughter, right? As yeah, I recall. Right, in the comics. But God forbid they made Gordon an actual character in these movies. Um, so is Gordon in any of these? He's in all of them. Um, I can't even remember him. He's the one at the very beginning who said, Hey, Batman, we have someone attacking the the museum his name's mr freeze 
Oh, so Gordon's the guy with the phone. He's the he's the guy that's like, hey, Batman, deal with it. Yeah, just like he was in the Adam West show. Yeah. Um. I like this too because it. I don't mind them changing her backstory, tying her to Alfred, because you get moments like this. Like, I really love this guy who plays Alfred, um, who I believe also maybe passed away now. Um, but oh, I'm sure, yeah. You, not, not to be grim, but yeah, sure, I would yeah. guess. It's, it is 25 years after this movie came out. Um, but, uh, you know, he, I was about to say I was kind of upset that she isn't a redhead, but then I kind of remembered how prominent Poison Ivy is in this, and I'm like, right. okay, I can see why you didn't double up. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, it's probably a, a palette thing. He's like, I can't have too many redheads in this room. <laughs> yeah, he's like, we use too many light filters. And, and uh, what are those called? Like light fills or whatever. Right. She, there'd be just too much red in the movie. Right. Um, yep. That's her stunt double climbing down the, the wall there? Yeah, that's why everything's shaded and then it <laughs> yeah. cuts and she jumps off the wall. <laughs> yeah, that's why it wasn't one take. <laughs> um, that's why there that's like uh, I did that once. I watched the beginning of Indie, one of the Indiana Jones movies, whichever the one is, uh, where the he, he gets chased by the boulder. Uh huh. And I was like, huh, I'm just gonna count the number of cuts in the film, like cut number of cuts of shots, uh, to see how many there are just in that opening scene. And there were like fifty. Oh yeah. And it's like, wow, that it's they filmed like. A bunch of different stuff. There's not even part of this seems anything close to one take. Like, but it just flows together and you don't notice. Bane can drive. So, yeah, Bane can drive apparently. <laughs> um, He's like he only knows words. Like the, what he picked up from that conversation was step. <laughs> Um, I like that Bruce mentions his father here. That's something that didn't happen a ton in these movies. Um, and this is like James Bond. Every movie they had to give Bruce Wayne a girlfriend so that he had a case of the not gays. Um, and, and, uh, and this one, and this one, the girlfriend in this one does absolutely the least of all the girlfriends in all the movies because she doesn't affect the plot at all. Although she does play a character, I believe from the comic books, um, she, she, she just has like three scenes in the movie where she's like, Bruce, I need you to be in love with me. And, 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 you know, if we're going to get married, we got to be together. And, you know, he's like, well, I'm Batman, you know, <laughs> it's like, it doesn't really add much to the movie. I think her name's L McPherson. Yeah. I don't know how he's not prepared at all for a marriage question. He's like, what? Uh, something the press cares about. <laughs> well, that just shows the disconnect between Bruce Wayne and the press. Like, he, 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 yeah, he doesn't know what they're like at all. I love that. I love that he just on the press says, oh, the, your boss was a lunatic. <laughs> it's like, that guy was completely crazy. Yeah. I do like that she does try to go to Bruce Wayne as a person. You know, like her first instinct isn't, I'm going to be Poison Ivy. Um, yeah, her first instinct is like, I wrote a 55-page proposal. Right. Yeah, right. Like, she uh, spent the time to, like, try to appeal to Bruce Wayne. And, I mean, if Bruce Wayne had been like, okay, like, let's set up a meeting and talk about what's feasible in the short term, then I think that would have, like, completely avoided the whole problem of the movie. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that he, 
I guess that's the 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 point of uh of the script where you're like okay i guess i have to buy into this or not um but like he he's probably looking at a proposal and like he said while you have nothing in here for diesel fuel or you know anything that would warm us or or feed us like you you literally your plan just by grazing over it seems like it would wipe humans off the planet so i'm sorry i can't agree to this and uh so i think in his head even though he doesn't say it out loud he's thinking Oh, she's just as crazy as her boss. <laughs> um, like, oh shit! Like the way you talk, you are clearly performing. But I do like that he has an alternative to her. He's like, hey, look, here's this. This is something else I'm working on that will raise awareness for the plants and 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 the rainforest and stuff. So he's like, it's it's small. It's not as extreme as your proposal, but I'll try. You know, like, and I, I'm like, see, that's I like Bruce Wayne as a humanitarian works for me. Like, uh, cause they don't, even in the comics, they don't do a ton with Bruce Wayne. And so having a guy who actively tries to go out and do things like, I really like that. Like the cartoon did that sometimes Bruce Wayne would get involved with homeless shelters in the comic books. And then to the point where when two, when two guys who work there disappeared, Bruce Wayne took an interest and I'm like, yeah, I like that. That's what's neat about Bruce Wayne is that as bad as he is at human connection at times, he cares like he he really cares and uh so in that episode it was really fun because he like he went and saved those two homeless guys found a couple others and then at the end he gives them all jobs at wayne enterprises oh that's nice yeah so i'm like yeah what's up like bruce wayne or like the bruce wayne who sometimes will add funding to arkham for more security because he's like hey we can't have these criminals running around it's like well that helps batman too and the city but it's it is Bruce Wayne involving himself in the community, and I, I they just I feel like they don't always they don't do that much of that these days, especially the Tom King stuff. Like we, could, we which I'm sure you'll probably talk about at some point during this. We can talk about Tom King whenever. Uh, that I that I like some parts of his Batman and not others. Okay, fair enough. I like zero parts of his Batman, so we're on the opposite sides of the spectrum there. I think. So, so let me ask you this, just to just to clear. I, the things I really like about Tom King's run mm-hmm. are the short stories he tells, like the one where Batman and Superman go to the carnival with Catwoman and Lois Lane. Oh, okay. Or when Poison Ivy takes over the world and it's only Catwoman and Batman who are not under her control. Okay, so like, you so the, the ones... King Batman stuff that I think is amazing. The ones that feel like cartoon episodes, basically. Really? I mean, and I don't think they need to be more than that. I think you can have amazing writing in that sort of short form, and I always find that short form the most challenging anyway. So when I see short form done well, I'm like, oh, I, I really gravitate towards it because I think it's impressive to do one. I think it's difficult. A- and uh, I don't know. I just, I, I just thought they were very interesting, fun stories. Yeah, yeah. Um... I agree. And while Commissioner Gordon's bringing out these diamonds here at the uh, jungle party that they're having, um, I agree with you. I think Batman, like uh, Batman and Superman, especially to me, they work better in episodic. So, like, I'm one of those people that I mean, I remember one time I was talking to an editor at DC about something, and I I didn't have a shot at writing anything. I was still too new at that point. But he, I think he was just curious, like picking my brain of like what kind of stories I would want to tell if I did anything. And I kept telling yeah. him. I kept telling him, do you have like a Batman anthology book, like Batman Confidential or Batman, you know, like a Batman annual or something? I go, because to me, Batman and Superman work the best in episodic form where it feels like you're just getting an episode of a show. And I go, they work. When when they're like two or three issue arcs. Right. That's where you can tell the coolest Batman and Superman stories. It's funny. I was I was pitching a bunch of one issue arcs. (laughs) I call one and done. I mean, one issue even is, is great as well. Yeah. And um. But I see what you mean. Yeah, like two, three episode arcs, like or issue arcs, like those to me work better for these characters. I the one thing I did not have, and I told him, I was like, "Look, man, if you're looking for someone with a five year plan on Batman, I ain't your guy. Like I can write Batman stories for five years probably, but they there wouldn't be a connecting thread like Tom King does. To me, that takes a a side of I don't want to say ego because some some writers do do it and they do it well. But it's just I can't bring my brain to a place where I can map out something that big. I tried it once when I worked at Arcana, and I came up with like I had to come up with like 150 characters, 
and they gave me like six months to work on it and I finished it, but it took so much out of me. And I, by the end, I was just kind of like, I never want to do this again. Like this is not my strengths as a writer. Yeah. It just seems like, like, I feel like you really have to divide it down into like, okay, here's the overarching story, but then here are my sub stories I'm telling within it. And you just have to like, take a big piece and you just have to slowly break it down into these smaller pieces. Yeah, like, I'm with I don't you. know, like if you were going to do the Sandman story is a good example because all the arcs feel pretty distinct from one another. So it's like, oh, you kind of know the general arc of Sandman. You kind of know where the story needs to go, but we can play around with how we get there. And we can like introduce new things that we might not have thought of at the beginning. Right, right. Um, this this scene here goes back to your stage uh, performance, I think. Uh, oh yeah, I mean this this whole yeah this whole scene does like with all the set dressing and the acrobatic work and how dressed up and like how much face paint and choreography is is in this. It's it's less acting and more of performing. Right. Yeah, and. As you can see, Batman and Robin and everyone in the crowd has been hit by her pheromones, so now everyone's like instantly in love with her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she uh, she's great because she really hams it up, but she like she she's in she's into the role that's for sure. Jesus. <laughs> Wild oats. Wouldn't you like the earrings too? <laughs> so that's Commissioner Gordon. Aww. Uh... And I think I called him of the wrong name. Or I think I called Alfred the wrong name earlier. I think I called him. I think I said the actor's name who plays Gordon instead of. So I apologize. Now I'm just now realizing that. <laughs> oh. I'll borrow it from you. Oh, God. Batman. Good for forever. Batman forever. Goth I love card. how it just said the, the, the expiration date was good for, and it just said forever. Yeah. It was still a Visa, though. <laughs> like, Visa was like, yeah, we'll, we'll issue credit to Batman. We assume he'll pay it. Yeah, like Batman himself has not not a not Bruce Wayne, Batman. Batman, it was a Batman card. Yep. I wonder what the APR is on that. I got to say the 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 fight scenes at least are um shot well to the point where you can see what's going on. Um, they're clear. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're distinct. Right. I particularly like that last shot, though, where Poison Ivy's butt was in the frame the whole time. <laughs> I, I will say, I think there's too many cuts. It makes it seem a little too uh, edited. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, because it's a, but they did I a lot of wire work. have to do that because yeah. it's kind of this stage production, weird stunt sort of thing. Then uh, they do it well. Right. <laughs> Garden gal. Every 
everything has to be a pun in some way. But yeah, everything's a one-liner. And so I can't remember who I was talking to, but they were like, oh, his lines are so bad. I go, but imagine, I now I picture Mr. Freeze when he was Victor Freeze before he got frozen as this guy who walked around with his wife and made terrible dad jokes that she always rolled her eyes at. You know, she's just like, oh, God. Yeah, I'm not... Just a guy who's like going to love his life with his beautiful wife, and then he turns into a frozen monster. <laughs> then he turns into all the puns he makes. Because uh, one thing, as far as an actor goes, too, when you think about Mr. Freeze is, I would imagine he's a difficult character to play because you're you're probably sitting there thinking, well, what what does a guy who doesn't really have emotions, how do you emote with that, you know? Uh, Ms., uh, clearly, Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't think about that once. Because <laughs> he's, like, laughing and making jokes. And he's, like, all kind, he's, like, angry. He's, like, he's a wide range of emotions. Um but uh, I don't know. What is your take on that? Like Mr. Freeze. Like, do you think he's someone who's just? Because I always saw him. Because he gets angry a lot. I always saw him as that when he was dying, he was frustrated and angry because his experiment went wrong or he was betrayed. So I always saw it as he was frozen in that emotion, and that's why he's always, like, that's the that's the reason why he gets upset is because he's always upset, almost like the Hulk, and he's like, you know, what I'm saying? Like, because that's the only emotion I feel like works for him to emote. And that's the only justification I can give to it. But I don't know. Do you see him as someone who can still tap into his emotions, if he, even if he's frozen? Well, I, I feel like he's someone who's the, the only real warmth in his heart is coming from, like, the hope of resurrecting his wife. Okay, yeah. Like, that, that's sort of like what I always kind of imagine that he's the, the world has made him cold. And this is his wife is his last hope of getting warm. Okay, okay. I like that. Like, uh, I, I haven't read too much Mr. Freeze in Batman comics. Like, my, my big exposure to it is, um, like, Sean Murphy's uh, uh, White Knight universe. Oh, yeah, uh, Von Freeze. Yeah, and Von, and Von Freeze is in there. And, again, he's really focused on his wife. Like, that's, that's sort of the, the crux of his story in there. Um, yeah, that's kind of the heart. I mean, like, ever since the Batman animated series, when that's how they kind of portrayed Mr. Freeze, like, they focused more on that element of him, he became mm -hmm. a f a more of a fan favorite. Um, I do like that scene there where Batman doesn't trust Robin to not get himself killed by ramping off the building, He so he just shuts his motorcycle down. And obviously that plays into the tension between them. So, like, I can appreciate that there was a story that they try to tell here, but they just, it got, it kept getting interfered with by all this hammy acting and puns. Yeah, it's, it's sort of interesting because, I don't know, I'm starting to like feel like the hammy acting and puns worked better than I I thought it was going to. I'm, I, again, now thinking of it as a stage production, like it takes on kind of a whole new light where I'm just like, oh, this is sort of more interesting or, or it works a little better in that context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is definitely one of those movies when people crap all over it. I always say, you should watch it again. Because uh, I, I feel like when you do, especially when you're older, you have a you see it a different way than you than the abomination it was when you were younger. Um, Grant Morrison has a great uh, comment on the nipples, as I'm seeing Robin's nipples here. Um, yeah. He blames Alfred for those. Um, because, uh, cause in the second, the third movie, Batman forever, um, Robin gets his costume taken by Alfred and Alfred tailors it, which, uh, as according to Grant Morrison, he says, you know, leather tailoring is really hard. So for Alfred to go and tailor in nipples, he's like, I'm, it says a lot about who Alfred is as a character. <laughs> <laughs> and he molds like, he molds the leather into their shapes of their butts and everything. It's like, and, uh. I just, I thought about that. And I was, it made me see Alfred in a whole new way. What Alfred really cares about in this world. He's just like, hey, let me just on Sunday, Bruce, don't forget on Sunday before you go fight crime, I got to mold your butt into leather. <laughs> yeah, you, you need to get a cast made. <laughs> yeah. Go sit over there in the goo. 
I like this too because I liked Bruce's shortness there. Like he's like, he goes, he's like, hey, congrats on capturing uh, Freeze. He's like, yeah, I know. Yes, I get it. Thanks. Um, I'm a genius. Yes. Yeah. But he's no, he's doing it because of this. He's like, am I a jerk? And I love Alfred's like, yeah, you are. That's a great line, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, like, there's some real stuff. And I love how he looks up and he sees a memory of Alfred. Like, every time he looks around the house, he just sees Alfred's, the memories he has with Alfred. And uh, I like that. It's, it's uh, even though that shot's <laughs> terrible CG or uh, uh, green screen. That's a weird uh, shot. It yeah. doesn't make any, like. Yeah, the angle's not right. Yeah. The angle's not right. It's weird to have a day shot like that. And it clearly wasn't lit properly either. It was just they like brought the camera out there and were like, shoot a kid being sat at a grave. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I do like that scene, and I love the line at the end when he's like, I guess I can't control my fate, can I? And Alfred says, none of us can. And I think that's when Bruce realizes, okay, he's not just sick, he's dying. I like that, too, because if I'm not mistaken, I think in Batman Forever, the first thing Robin sees or Dick Grayson sees that makes him connect to Bruce is the motorcycles. Oh, that's kind of a nice connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the lightning's even green in this scene. The, yes, right. <laughs> like, it's giving off this green glow, and it's like, clearly that doesn't make any logical sense, but it's, it's a character foreshadowing. Right. It's like, oh, who is on the horizon? Yes. Uh, we're going to get uh, a cameo here from, uh, from uh, I think, I can't remember, was Jesse the Body Ventura a senator or something? Or did he run for governor or mayor? He used to be a wrestler, that guy they are talking The guy on the left, um, his name's Jesse. I think it's Jesse the Body Ventura. I can't remember. He was a WWE wrestler, I think, back in the day. This also makes no sense. Um, you can't triangulate ice straight down like that. <laughs> like it's uh, not that that matters too much, but um, yeah, as soon as he steps out of that light, he's. He's in room temperature all of a sudden. <laughs> um if you have never seen the Batman Beyond episode where Mr. Freeze comes back, it is really awesome. Um, in the future, Mr. Freeze is just a head in a jar. Oh, really? Oh, I kind of remember that. Yeah, it's, I thought that was pretty cool. Yes, that's how the, the government lets people know that things are condemned. They write it in glow paint. <laughs> yes. I like the name is Turkish Bath for this place. But here we get the, the, the Blacklight uh, gang. Yeah, there's kind of a bath. These A version of these guys, I think, are in that new video game coming out. So it seems like that new video game likes the, liked this movie too. And Bane with the spikes on his neck, it's so dominatrix. Oh, yeah, it's got such weird connotations. Like, <laughs> yeah. it, it's such an overly produced set design. 
Yeah. Pain. Listen, listen to the sound effect. Ready? Like the most cartoony sound effect ever. Yeah, like ever. The, there's like a very slight whistle in there. Like, woo woo woo! <laughs> yeah, it's exactly like you'd see in like a Looney Tunes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually like the scene, the, the purple light coming in. Um, <laughs> that is so bad. I love it. Everything's a one-liner. There's no dialogue in this movie. <laughs> yeah, it's no. Yeah. What is this floor? Yeah, see, Apocalypse stole that line from Poison Ivy. Let me just put some glitter in the ground. Yeah, let me just sprinkle some glitter and uh, dollar store gems. <laughs> but I like that. Like the the plants are actually wrapping around in the background. That's that's really well done for a I think mostly a practical effect. And I mean, I get that there's some CG, but they're kind of yeah. like put it out of focus of the camera so right. to mask it a little bit. Right, yeah. Which which helps cheat it. Like, again, the effects, even this is CG, I can tell, but at the same time, like, it's, it's kind of done off in the periphery, a little bit out of focus, and it, and it just sells it a little bit better because of that. It just... It's a movie that was very aware of its limitations and really tried to lean on its practical effects side, which I think is cool. I agree. It's definitely cool. Um, here's the the case of the not gays scene. Um, <laughs> where she's just like the most under. They're like, all right, we got two scenes with her, so let's just make her super understanding. Like, I get it. You I, have, I, yeah. Like, I get it. You're a, a billionaire who has a dark secret. I, I'm here for you. <laughs> right. I will be sitting here with a cup of tea right. all night. Right. Um, yeah. Just make me your wife, God damn it. <laughs> You can kiss me any time we're married. <laughs> and it's like, I get it. Someone would probably argue, well, it's now he sees poison ivy and like he's infected. And that's why these scenes exist. And I'm like, I would rather these scenes not exist. Um, you could still have the poison ivy thing because Bruce is kind of living throughout old memories in this movie. And, oh, shit. <laughs> and that's the last scene they're in together, I think, in this movie. Um, and I love how she's like not upset. She's just like curious. She's like, "Oh, who's Ivy?" Yeah, who's Ivy? Should we invite her over? Like, is she a good friend that I will have once I marry you? But to me, you already have this subplot of Bruce Wayne ha living down memory lane, and so you could easily have like his memories affected because of Ivy sink. So maybe he sees that scene again where it's him and Alfred out of the gravestone, and then maybe Poison Ivy's in the background or something, like walking around or. Or she's in a memory of Bruce's that he can't possibly have. Like, you could have done something else where it's still affecting there's Bruce. A lot, there's a lot of other ways to cheat it. Like, he could just be sleeping and she could kiss him while he sleeps. Yeah, right. He doesn't need to have a girlfriend for that one scene. Yeah, like, there's a lot of ways you could have, like, infected him. Like, it could have been at the charity ball, even. Like, why, did it not do, why didn't she just kiss him at the charity thing? It's true. Um, <laughs> I like all the different gangs here. A lot of them are movie references. Um, I do like, uh, this song is by Maloko, I think. Um, and there's, a. oh God, I'm blanking on his name now. Buster Rhymes? Buster Rhymes. I think? I may be, no, that's not Buster Rhymes. 
I don't know. Uh, Coolio? Coolio. Sorry, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm like, Did wait I get a... that right? Is that Coolio? Oh, my God. That was a guess. I, th- I think. I, I, I could be wrong. It could. I don't know if you can look it up, but... Um... Yeah, I can't remember. He is definitely like a, a 90s rapper, so I, I can't remember who it was, though. Surprisingly, not on the soundtrack, which I was like, wait, that's a missed opportunity. That's kind of funny, yeah. Is there like a little kid there? Yes, there is. <laughs> Part of the <laughs> Yeah, he's, I don't like, think it's a... Got it, Dad. Yes, yeah. He's yeah. Like, Hopefully beat this lady in a motorcycle race. I really want to eat tonight. Yeah, no, Buster Rhymes. I'm, what movie was I thinking of? He's in one of the Halloween movies because he's yoked. And Buster Rhymes is a big dude. And then, um, who's the who's the rapper in the third Fast and Furious movie? Uh, in Tokyo there's, Drift. There's, yeah, there's like a guy in there who I also don't know if is on the soundtrack or not. Oh, interesting, huh? In Tokyo Drift. Oh, I don't remember. And that's my favorite Fast and the Furious movie. I don't remember. There are other Fast and Furious movies beyond <laughs> Tokyo Drift? Yeah, there's some with numbers in them. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, I don't know all about that math. <laughs> that fire is green. I just love pointing out the weird colors, like <laughs> yeah. things where it's like design. Yeah, the, but it's inaccurate. The the it, it it's funny because you could argue that this even has the the color palette of a comic book panel. Oh yeah, I mean that's really feels what they were going for. Like they're like we want everything to be kind of this 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 bright color that sticks out. Like like he, under the bridge, it was it, there's yellow lights are under this blue bridge, and it's like it can't be its own color. It's got to everything's got to have this weird distinct like sort of break to it right right where you really defining the foreground and the background and, and and really kind of creating this weird dimensional feel to it right yeah you're right man i like that shot right there that across the bridge uh-huh. um more miniature work there i believe um <clears throat> those wide shots with gotham are usually miniatures A green fire. <laughs> yeah, and the fire is clearly like red, but they 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 had to like doctor it up to be green. Yeah, yeah, they they fit, they did it in post. Yeah. And like how unrealistically long this skit is. Yes, right. But it's like, what are they like going on ice? Well, he did fight Mr. Freeze, so maybe there's some residual ice on his jacket and pants. <laughs> now, that does look terrible, that shot, but... Yeah. See, even it that's a pun. Like, this is where you hang out. <laughs> Everything's a one-liner. Yeah, it's exactly. A one-liner. Yeah. Echo, stop. I do like all this stuff here where she, her perception of Alfred's life. Um, her face is always dirty. Yeah, well, to be fair, most scenes we've seen her in, it's after she was in a motorcycle race. <laughs> That's true, but she's always, it's like it's weird. She's got like the same dirt mark from before too. It's like clearly they just shot that 
these shots consecutively. Right. Being like, her face is already dirty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were like, all right, we're, this is the dirty face scenes day. I can tell. I'm Batman. I'm a detective. And like, I pay his medical bills. Uh, wait a minute. The guy who sewed nipples into my costume is sick? Wait, the man whose insurance I pay for <laughs> is using his insurance? <laughs> Um, so this is from the cartoon, I believe. Um, I can't remember if it happened in the comics also, but I know it's from the cartoon, but I like that they incorporated it into the movie with the creating the little music box with his wife in it. So if he has to stay cold, why do they even bother giving him a blanket in his cell? <laughs> hey, sometimes it's too cold, you know? <laughs> And a blanket will make the difference. <laughs> yeah. That's what they gave me when I went to the hospital for hypothermia. <laughs> gave me a blanket. I think in these scenes, they constantly shoot her from the waist up because of potential camel toe. Oh, because the, the closer-up shots are t the, the suit's too tight? I, I think. I think I remember that comment someone made, so I think so, yeah. Because, yeah, the further shots away... Yeah, it's like... Uh, see if they do anything. Yeah, yeah. Because that's just for ratings reasons. She, yeah, she really commits to the the Riddler yeah, jacket. I love that and Two Faces jackets there. Um, oh, I think that I think for a second there he grabbed his mask because it was slipping off. And you're kind of like you couldn't do a second take. I guess not. Had to take a while to reset that wall. Well, what's so funny is that shot we just went where the camera panned around. If you would have looked out the window on the door, you could actually see Bane yeah. just standing there. Oh, really? Yeah, he's like down the hall, but you can see him just standing there. What do you think else freezes when you become Mr. Freeze? Like, you, obviously you get yeah, no... Like, are you gonna like? Are you just have frozen pee? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. Does he have to go to the bathroom anymore? Like, he yeah. Like, does he have icicle poops? He eats TV dinners, so I, I can't would imagine. <laughs> Look, what the. <laughs> And I feel like this is one of those things where I believe Joel Schumacher when he says, Akiva Goldsmith didn't write a lot of this. It's like, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> I, I could see Joel Schumacher just saying, say something funny. <laughs> yeah, or like there's just an onset writer. Possibly, yeah. Hey, come up with something stupid. Okay. Um. Jesus. <laughs> it's like, they can't, it's like, I want to have like an, a, some kind of m like, uh, meeting for these people. Like, uh, like, all right, the one-liners, we got to talk about them. <laughs> It'd be called a meatloaf. Mr. Bane. What do you what 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 are, you, what are your thoughts on the design of Arkham in this movie? It's it's 
exactly what I'd expect if you were making like a set dressing for a for a musical, <laughs> like this, this big looming looming like kind of hard to get to tower overlooking a cliff. Like that's yeah, that's a prison asylum if I've ever heard one described. <laughs> and and that's I think what people's problem is with this movie is that it's just so over the top. Right. But. But, like, retrospectively, like, almost 30 years later, looking at it, it's sort of what makes it fun. Like, if it was just sensible for the time, it'd just be like a whatever Batman movie. But but this kind of adds a, a, a different fun element to it. I agree. I agree. Thanks for coming in and ruining a great scene, Robin. Jeez, Robin. How dare you get us back to the Batman action? <laughs> yeah, there's this really tender moment between two really good actors, and then yeah, there's Commissioner and, Gordon. And that scene panning down, you could totally tell those cars were miniatures. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The way the light hit them, it really like showed the glossiness of them. Okay, yeah. I mean, most likely, yeah. I can't remember what exactly were miniatures in this, but I know they used a ton of miniatures in this. And I mean, they for the most part, that like again, that's something that I like about this movie. It's like, oh, it's fun to really kind of look and examine the set dressings because I think that's the most interesting part of this movie. I agree. To me, um, I know people say like, oh, Gotham is like it's like New York or it's this city or that city or you know whatever. And to me, Gotham and Metropolis have always been Gotham and Metropolis. They have an architecture that is completely baffling. Similar. Yeah, like uh, I think Bruce Tim said about Gotham when he did the Batman animated series, he said um, Gotham City to him is if the 1930s World Fair never ended. And I'm like, that's the best description of Gotham because they got like blimps in the air for police and they got like uh -huh. the, these monorails uh, instead of trains. It's like, I like that a lot. It's much cooler. Yeah, it just makes it kind of like this futuristic retro world at the same time, which I don't know. I just find, I just found it interesting. I just, it's just a, 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 a weird, um, very, very distinct design feel to this whole, like even looking at, uh, poison Ivy's hair style where she's got these two kind of cone like buns on the top. Right. And it's it somehow it, it somehow reminds me of the future and the past. Yeah. Nope. Oh. I can smell her vajay. Look at even this that all the police tape is red. Yeah. Oh and, yeah, and it's so it doesn't like it, if it's yellow, it would clash with stuff. So they had to change it. That's and again, it's like a, a design choice that's all color palette based. Right, you're right. Because yeah, why would police? Why would it be? Why would it be red? You're right. Um, yeah, I, Joe Schumacher is a. I know people hate him for these movies, but. He's a great director. I mean, Lost Boys is such a fantastic movie. St. Elmo's Fire, Falling Down, 8mm, which he did after this, which is just one of the darkest movies I've ever seen in my life. Um, and uh, it's actually so good with the detective stuff that you're like, I'm surprised this guy couldn't make a Batman movie. But it, the main reason is because when he he's like, hey, I'm, when I think of Batman, I think of the Adam West TV show. He's like, so I wanted to make something that was a nod to that. And it's like, okay, so once you understand what he's going for, like you said, making a stage play of it, you can appreciate it for what it is, but it unfortunately, it's like Zack Snyder. It's like you made a version of a character that most people have their own version of. So when you pick one version, it's going to alienate the other people. Um, yeah, I guess that is very true. That's like the people who probably grew up loving this when they saw it were a kid were probably like, what the hell are you doing when Christopher Nolan's Batman came out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're like, it's not funny, it's not fun, like there's no color in it. Right. Um, 
We haven't talked much about the costumes. What do, what do, about Batman and Robin's costumes? Um, obviously, he still has the inability to turn his head left and right, but what do you think of the suit overall? It's, it's weird because you can kind of, like, even in the scenes, especially when he's sort of stretched out, you can see where they kind of come together and how how many pieces are really sort of part of it. Right. And, and it definitely um, feels like... I keep saying this, but it feels like a production. It doesn't feel like something that's meant to do anything but sort of look good on a stage. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I like how they're instantly warm. And, oh, yeah, they recovered immediately. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. Um and then they fall down the stairs like a bunch of cartoon characters. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, this, this movie has a lot of cartoonish elements to it, especially with the sound effects. Right. Um, so I know one thing and that... like how in oh. the background here, it's a very dark kind of brooding atmosphere of this like weird chemical room, but it's got cartoons of ice cream drawn on the back wall. <laughs> right. Right. Um, the um, the Robin costume or the Nightwing costume is neat because this is the first time we see him in in black and red because um, that was a design that came into the New 52 comic books but it, normally in the comics obviously the, the bird on his chest is blue yeah it's blue yeah um, but it was it's clearly like to kind of make him more Robin-esque well that's the thing is they wanted to keep the red of, from the Robin theme because the reason it's blue in the comics is because he got it from Superman. Um, but in the in the movie, they're like, well, they mentioned Superman, but we don't. Robin doesn't know Superman uh, according to us. So, um, yeah. So I like I like that. But then, um, but it does look good. I think his his Nightwing costume looks great in this movie. Uh, he's got to lose the cape though. The the capes are sort of ridiculous. I, I will say they. <laughs> Especially when they were playing hockey, I'm like, why is no one grabbing the cape? They're right. just twirling in front of them. <laughs> this is also one of those movies that has too much plot. Um, There's too much going on in it. Yeah, I because mean, there are a lot of villains. We're, we're but but not we're even kind of that. Just, even with the villains. But even with the heroes, they have a sick Alfred. That's a story point. They have a. Uh, like a, a Bruce Wayne that's looking Batgirl. down memory lane. We have Batgirl introduced, and we have a Robin that wants to break away from Batman and have tension with him and go solo. These are all stories from the comic books that are just thrown in here, just like kind of... Everyone sort of has conflict with everyone. Right, and, I, and I'm all for everyone having something to do, but it, it, it doesn't have... there's It does pull away from a Some focus. Some people are doubling up. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, you could have taken out one or two of these villains and one or two of these characters and it probably would have streamlined better. Yeah, like if you would... Not, I kind of like Batgirl, but like if you had taken kind of her out of it or taken away sort of the conflict she has and maybe made it more focused on like her training to be part of the Bat family... Yeah, because like, I they, could have been an interesting angle to play. Like it, it, it may have been more interesting if they had done something like, like Batgirl and Robin are like training together, and Batgirl is starting to overshadow Robin, and he gets insecure because of that, and now he has conflict with Batman, and that kind of could condense that story down. Yeah, that's a good point. Um. I do like that. She, her, she's she's so fixated on wiping out humanity. <laughs> um, you're right over there. I hear a lot of ruffling in your mic. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was leaning over to pet my dog. Oh, okay. Hello, dog. He just needed to say hi, didn't you, buddy? I like that she points at herself. 
<laughs> a chance for Mother Nature. And then she brings in uh, the plant from uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, it is. Yeah, it looks exactly like it. <laughs> Feed me, Seymour. It's a practical effect. Yeah, it's a practical effect. That's right. It's just a turning head and a wiggling tongue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all you need. Like, why does Mr. Freeze, like, he's like, oh, okay, you just want to run a world full of plant monsters? Cool. Like, why is he all of a sudden into uh, into that like plan? Sure. Yeah. Oh, this, I think this is one of the scenes where, um... There's a cure for McGregor syndrome, strange one, as we saw from that LED readout for the series. Uh, right, when they say that, because I'm like, oh, wait, but you just, uh, like, 20 minutes ago told us that you can survive that. Um, yeah. And I love how they're like, so, like, oh, he's been hiding it forever. It's stage one of four. And it's like, he apparently hasn't been hiding it that long then, like, if it's only at stage one. Yeah, yeah, no, he hasn't, yeah, he's just been hiding it since the movie started. Oh, that's why. Okay. So there's a cure, but no one knows it except Mr. Freeze. Oh, we don't know what it is. <laughs> a robin symbol in the sky but i like that too because like as as frustrating as that is that's such a young person who is strong-willed like dick Grayson. that's such a thing for him like it's he would say something stupid like that in in the in the heat of the moment you know like like hey man i fight crime just like you do you know like um i'm just as good it's 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 a Maybe it's not a Dick Grayson quality per se, but it is definitely a young man's perspective. Like a, a lot of us want to get out of the shadows of our mentors in, in some ways. Um, and I like that Alfred has a backup plan here. He's like, hey, I have like a brother or cousin or something. And br like bring him into this and show him this file um, that basically gives Bruce Wayne's secret away. <laughs> I hope Wilfred's as good as Alfred is. So I think even this big telescope in some way is in the new Batman Gotham Knights video game. Is it really? Oh, that's kind of cool that they incorporate even the telescope in there. Kind of. Like, there's a device in it. I don't know if it's exactly a telescope, but there's a big device like this in it. Oh, I forgot. I she has one more scene. Oh, it's the girlfriend. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny because a telescope also feels like one of those things that, like, a 1950s philanthropist would <laughs> put for like the future of a city like oh we're going to see the stars right it's got that old and new feel to it it's so cool it's funny when they play her down as poison ivy they do a really good job because this dress she's wearing is hideous <laughs> <laughs> They even, like, take her hair, uh, like, really mute her hair. Yeah, they make it really flat, like it's been ironed. Um, mm -hmm. They take all the red out. I mean, obviously, she's wearing a wig when sure. she's, like, poison ivy. Sure. Um. D 
Dude, he's he's so old. He's gonna get hit. Uh, he's gonna have a heart attack. All the blood that's gonna run rush, rush through him. All that four pheromones. Yeah, he's like, oh, oh god. Yeah, she double dosed the living crap out of him, like up close. Oh, ageist. Oh, she won't kill an old man. What a fool. Oh, you'll kiss Jesse the body of Ventura, but not Commissioner Gordon. What a jerk. Yeah. What are you doing? Like, propose. <laughs> Just propose to Julie already. I think that's her name. I can't remember if she's Julie Madison or if she's... Uh, I'm, oh, Chase Meridian. That's the girl from uh, the Batman Forever. That's a... Uh, yeah. Tom Cruise's old wife. Can't, I'm blanking on her name. Katie Holmes? No, his wife before her. <laughs> oh, I don't know. She was um she was in Aquaman recently, I think. I think she plays Aquaman's mom. Oh, oh, not Amber Heard. No, not not someone who gets in a relationship where they beat each other and emotionally destroy each other. Does that not sound like Tom Cruise a little bit? <laughs> I mean, he might have done it to What's her name? She was in uh, Eyes Wide Shut um and she was in Batman Forever. Um I can't think of her name. She's in Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise, actually. They got divorced soon after that movie came out. Probably because of how weird that movie was. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> she was like, this is this is the project you wanted to work on together, Tom? Yeah, she's like, we're a bunch of rich Except people. Just reminded, me of, reminded you of my mom. <laughs> you wanted to make this movie where a bunch of rich people put on masks and go to sex parties? We already do that, Tom. <laughs> it's like, just wanted to make a movie about us. Oh, here's the scene. So this scene I like with Bruce and Alfred. Like, I like every scene in this movie with Bruce and Alfred. I love that. There's no defeat in death. It's this little lines like that where you're like, yeah, I can see how Akiva Goldsmith won an Academy Award later on in his life when he wasn't making comic book movies. Because <laughs> 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 uh, um, there's a real gravity to those lines and and I, I like that Alfred's okay. He's like he's ready. He's like, it's fine, man. Like, I know you're gonna be sad, but it's it's okay. Like I'm good with this. Um, yeah, and this I guess the the. I guess the if you're gonna make an argument for all the characters that are in this movie. The one thing you do have with Mr. Freeze as a villain, who is someone who lost his wife, it's now, it's parallel to Batman. He's about to lose somebody through the same disease, no less. And then, and then you have, uh, like, Bruce being this guy who is coming to terms with the fact that he's like this prick. And that he, he plays Robin. He leaves, he, you know, like, like at the beginning, he leaves the Batcave first and then Robin follows like he he kind of subliminally is a d-bag to his own partner and and the 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 arc of batman in this is that he embraces family so by the end he's got now kind of two quote unquote kids he's got batman or robin and batgirl to look after and yeah it, it, yeah. going back to like the parallel of him and mr freeze yeah you you have like even the rising tension between them where poison ivy makes it seem like batman like killed Mr. Freeze's wife or whatever. Right. And and Batman could hold resentment because Freeze cured this disease but he hasn't revealed it to the world. He could have saved Alfred. Alfred could still be alive. Right. So it's like that 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 mounting tension between them as well. Yeah, you're right. And that comes into a head as we'll see it at at the end here. Um 
But what I like Wait, you're is saying that he has a climax. <laughs> that, yeah, there's a there's a I actually think there's a great climax between Mr. Freeze and Batman. I know that sounds like a weird phrase. <laughs> I like that he calls him Mr. Bane. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love that. Um, and then he had to make like a Mr. dick Bane. joke there. <laughs> Mr. Freeze made a dick joke. You're right. I just keep hearing you like drooling on the mic or something. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me <laughs> lift it. It's all right. I just want to make sure you're right. I'm like, is is he drooling over those bat nipples? <laughs> We're drooling. <laughs> Finally, you talk to him like he's a grown-up. I can't remember their names, but these are two pretty good character actors that have been in a lot of stuff in the 90s. Um, I can't think of who they are, but... Can't remember everything, Alex. Jesus. Jeez, see, how are you not an encyclopedia for these movies? <laughs> Now this is where it gets a little silly, uh, like not. It's. Oh, well, this is where it gets silly. <laughs> I just realized how that sounded when I said it. Uh, yeah, this is the the rest of it's now, been this all. Is where you might notice a bright color palette <laughs> in this film. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is the point where it goes all downhill. No, um, first of all, the bombs look stupid. They don't look like they work at all. Um, but they're great for a stage play because anyone in the audience could see them from a distance. Um, but I do like... Uh, so in this this is the part where it's like, all right, we got 12 minutes to thaw everybody. So they so pretty much from the moment he sets off his gun or the whatever it is here, his device... It's like from then on, the rest of the movie is supposed to take place in 12 minutes, but it's like 30 minutes of, of movie watching. Yeah, we got like 29, and it, like we got 30 minutes left of this movie. <laughs> right, yes, right. <laughs> He's like, we got to thaw him in seven like, minutes. and it's have a... like 18 minutes of credits? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ooh, blue and red lights. So this is when we find out that Alfred's really creepy because he molded butt leather for his own niece. Oh, yeah, or he's like, I, I measured you while you slept. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I know your bus size and your waist size, darling. Um, no, I think he has like a, like a program that scans her, to be, to be fair. Much like Max Headroom. See? I took the liberty. That's his exact line from Batman Forever. Here we go. Oh, God. Yeah, butt. Breasts. No nipples. Yeah, her nipples are covered by another layer of leather. Yeah, they he put like a leather bra over the nipples. Yeah, like if they put a leather bra over her leather boobs. <laughs> I mean, come on, it's his niece. So show some respect. I do like that completely unrealistic motorcycle he drives, though. Um, I actually yeah, like the I, the motorcycle I, more I, than I like the really Batmobile. Think it contrast, Mr. Freeze's very realistic mode of transportation of a spike golf cart. Uh, that's very real. I've seen those driving down I four. Yeah. I saw, yeah, I, I saw him all the time in retirement communities in Tucson. <laughs> See? So what the hell are you bringing that up for? <laughs> oh my. Um, I think that motorcycle is 
from the third movie, Batman Forever, there's a motorcycle that Bruce Wayne says, uh, oh yeah, this is called a Vincent Black Knight, which is made up. But I thought it was real for like 10 years until I found it wasn't. Um, and you were like, I want a Vincent Black Knight. That's exactly what I said. And it, it never existed. So, um, but Bruce, like, he's like, yeah, I have, there's only 101 on the planet. I have two of them. And I think Robin turned one of them into his motorcycle. So he left one. And left one, yeah. I like that he, like, is testing the water. Like, I'm going to test and see if I can walk on these. It's like, you know what you can walk on is the cement surrounding that pool. <laughs> yeah, it's like, why not just go around, sir? And normally, if he made that decision, you would want this wide shot where you can see him walking across the water, and it's one single take, and there's, like, this big, colorful background. And instead, it's close-ups of his feet touching the lily pads, and you're like, that makes no sense. And you're like, okay, I guess that's fine. You're like, yeah, what a waste of that. Did she say for luck or fluck? I don't know. I think I guess for luck. Trim those nose hairs, Robin. Why would you say that to her still up close to her? <laughs> yeah. Because she could just lean in and kiss you again. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's the... Oh, uh, okay, thank you for letting me know. I do like her in all red. She looks hot. Yeah, I mean, I think she's been, like, a really... Like, she's very hot in this movie. She's yeah. a very attractive woman. Oh, like, yeah. she's got a cool Poison Ivy persona. I agree. Could you imagine her with, like, a... As Harley, as as not as Harley as Poison Ivy, but with a Harley, they would be great together. Yeah, they kind of would, like especially like a very um, bubbly Harley as well, like someone who kind of contrasted her like long, exaggerated personality and someone who kind of like booped around a little bit was a little more manic. Right. Yeah. Oh, feminist fighting. Oh, reverse shot. I love that. They 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 couldn't they couldn't film him dipping back into the water, so they just reversed the footage. <laughs> um It's always funny in these older movies to see stuff like that where you're like, Oh, that's how you had to cheat it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I like so remember that shot when she's like, as I told Lady Freeze before I pulled her plug. You're going to see that exact footage, and you're going to be like, how did Batgirl record it from that angle? Doesn't matter. That's the that's the answer. It doesn't matter. That right there, you're right. A thousand percent would be how she got defeated on a stage play. Yeah, like, that's, that's totally a stage sort of thing. It's weird. It feels like a lot of the decisions in this movie were made with the stage in mind. Like a lot of the shot breaks are these really weird close-up shots to kind of show you like what's happening in that small space. Yeah. <laughs> they made a PC joke, dude. This movie's ahead of its time, bro. I like that. She's like, I'm Batgirl. He's like, that's not very PC. Why not Bat person? <laughs> Look at that. He's got... So that little thing in front of his mouth is shining a light on his teeth. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, again, just to make his teeth look white so it looks good in the color or it looks like the correct color in the color palette. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, they're they shining a blue light on his teeth. Oh, sorry, yeah, blue light, just to, like, make it match the color palette. Right, yeah. exactly, right, yep. <laughs> now, 
Taco did Bell. Did Ice Ice Baby come out before or after this movie? Did what come out? Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby. Oh, like eight years before this movie. So I, I'm i really sad there isn't an Ice Ice Baby reference. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the only Ice reference they didn't make in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, look at all these, these all these great miniatures, and then this is the set. I, I, it's really well done. It is. It's, it's just it's clever and it's uh, well thought out, and it's like oh, you didn't just rely on shitty special effects. You actually kind of like mapped it out and 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 used the practical angles, which make it look so much better. Right. All right, so here we go. We got 11 minutes to thaw the city, even though it was all frozen at different times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's the golf cart. There's your golf cart, bro. Look at their vehicles, though. She's yeah, just straight yeah, up on a car. motorcycle. I love that. <laughs> She's like, we didn't have time to make you a new vehicle. No, you didn't. She just landed. What are you... Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. I I did that. <laughs> Boom. There goes your golf cart, bruh. Hey, your golf cart has DeLorean doors on it. That's kind of cool. My my favorite thing about these movies, from Tim Burton to Joel Schumacher, is that there's no regular buildings. Like like this building they're going to is literally held up by the hands of a statue. Like. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's on like the side of this weird kind of mountainous thing. Which is in directly in the middle of the city because there's a cityscape behind them and in front of them. Yeah, it's kind of like almost the cityscape is like a wall. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like, oh, on the other side of the wall is Metropolis. Like, oh, we're going to have a big battle sequence in a planetarium with planets going off. And it's it's such a, like, this is how you'd make it if it was a, a set. You'd project the planets on the ceiling to make it look like a planetarium. Right, right. Wow, that's fast acting to acting. Eight minutes from right now, dude. Let's time it. How much time is left in the movie? We might actually, it might actually be accurate. Yeah, you two kids go out there and possibly die by falling off of a giant mountain. Take these children, take these lasers out onto this ledge. <laughs> How did he sneak up on Batman? <laughs> He's like a mech. <laughs> yeah, it's like your footsteps make a lot of noise, dude. Right. Oh, look at that chin scrunch there with that shirt close up of Batman. Right, yeah. <sighs> yep, that'll create a lot of traction for you. Ice. <laughs> yeah, it just. Oh! Now, at this level, if you're going to do it, you're probably going to dislocate your shoulder. At the sudden stop? Yeah, it's like it's, gonna, it's not like this gentle glide down. It's like a hard yank. Right, yeah, yeah. No, you're going to tear your arm right out of its socket. Yeah, you're not going to hold on to that. Like, you need to wrap it around and secure it to, like, yourself to have any chance of survival. And then it'll just cut you in half. 
I mean, yeah, like, it, you gotta, like, attach it to, like, a belt or something. Right. And then maybe the belt holds out. But yeah. you definitely, it's like a, I'm gonna sacrifice part of my body to save the rest of me. Right. I love this. B B Bane just hiding out down here. <laughs> So Batgirl has heels too. Like Alfred was like, "Oh, my niece will need heels for crime fighting." <laughs> yeah. I just imagine those scenes where he's like roundhouse kicking Mister Freeze, and he's not actually lifting his leg because there's no way, there's not enough room. There's just some like person in front of Batman swinging a, a wooden <laughs> like leg at <laughs> like, like a rubber leg. A leg? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way you can get it with the leather suit like... there's no way he could do like a butterfly kick in, in that where he was posed so yeah yeah well there goes bane <laughs> Um, just like the Dark Knight Rises, manipulated by a woman. I mean, kind of, yeah. Jeez, what a weird parallel. Yeah, no kidding. They have a lot in common, these two Banes. Mr. Bane. One was smart and one was dumb, but they were both, uh, slave to their heart. They're both pussy whipped. <laughs> I mean, yeah. They were both simps. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that term for the first time yesterday. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. I, to be fair, I just learned what that was like a month ago, so I'm I'm new to it as well. I well, you have an excuse. Like you're you're in your 30s. I'm in my 20s. I should be up on this slang. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like a uh, that yeah. I, I meant that in a reverse. Like a yeah, you kind of should have known before me. But uh, but to but to be I fair to the situation, I just found out a month ago. So. I think you knew about thirsty before me. You knew about all these slang terms before me. You're you're all hip on the internet kid stuff. <laughs> I, it's YouTube. I'm, I'm up on YouTube. That's it. You know all about the TikToks and all the 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 Snapchats. Yeah, it's funny. I don't have I don't have accounts for either yeah. one of those. Yeah. I don't need. Yeah, no, none of those appeal to me. TikTok is just a bunch of people doing weird dances. I'm not into that. I don't get it. I don't get what the premise of it is. And and people like will send me like they'll send me a link and I'm just like I'm not going to click on a TikTok video. I think that's going to give me a virus. Yeah, it's like people they're either dancing or they're or they're using footage of another TikToker doing something and they're pretending they're the other person in the conversation. And I'm like I don't get it's any of this. Weird. Yeah, it's like people reenacting stuff sometimes. The weird thing is seeing I saw someone send me a video where it's like someone posing like an anime character where they're just doing a bunch of anime poses with their hands and face and they have like fake teeth in their mouth like with fangs on them and i'm like what is this and they're like oh they're doing an anime thing i go isn't it cool i go no it's not cool <laughs> i was like it's, like it's it's a thing it's weird and awkward <laughs> yes it's it's weird for a 38 year old to watch i'll say that <laughs> Um, grab onto my belt. Oh, that that audio is so overmodulated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel like a lot of the uh, the dialogue in this movie is ADR. It actually it is because it's funny you brought that up. There are scenes where Bruce is walking down the hallway, talking to Robin, and uh, or Alfred, and his voice sounds like it's right up next to a microphone. Um, and it's because a lot, like a lot. It is. <laughs> it, it's actually ADR'd some of those lines. You're right. It feels like a lot of it. Like, even the opening scene with them leaving in the Batmobile and in the Robin cycle. Like, I was like, is that all ADR? Like, it doesn't seem to exactly match up how it should. Um, yeah. I would imagine, I would imagine a lot of these lines are ADR. Because I'm going to guess that these sets they built are loud as shit. Um, Resident, I did, I did that in my Resident Evil, 
Apocalypse commentary, I had heard, and Miljovic had confirmed this, that she ADR'd every line in that movie. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. And I'm like, yeah, the movie where you're running motorcycles, like, through church windows and stuff, like, you really had to ADR that? Like, but I guess the reason she chose to ADR even the quiet scenes was because she didn't like the sound of her voice. So she wanted to make Alice sound tougher. So she made that whole (laughs) post-production work harder (laughs) so she could ADR an entire movie. Um, And and that's kind of like a weird reason to do it, but at the same... Oh, they all just freeze off instantly. Yep, they're done. That's healthy. Yeah, yeah, and now they're normal and they're they're in no pain. And then none of them have hypothermia. They're just a little wet. I, I have hypothermia sitting alone in my apartment in Florida, and these people are fine. Not yeah, fair. Yeah, this is why we want to watch this movie to teach you how to recover like an adult. <laughs> I'm such a puss. <laughs> with this, yeah, that dog is just shaking it off. <laughs> yeah, and here me, I here I am putting Instagram posts. I'm such a baby. Oh Jesus Christ! Get a sweater. <laughs> I did. I had to wear one today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't make fun of me. Oh, this, so this I, scene's I'm good. I'm gonna say I genuinely have enjoyed this movie. Yeah, me too. It's it's good to watch with a friend. I like this scene though. Watch this. You're like, how did Batman record this? He wasn't even there. Joel Schumacher shot that. I like his gums. His gums look so gross there. Yeah, they're like like almost look infected and green, and they they kind of like really parallel the the redness in his skin. Yeah, I like it that. It really does make it look sickly. Yeah. Yeah, I like that his veins are red. It's really cool looking. Um. This is my favorite thing about Batman. And he doesn't do it nearly enough. He is not going to punch his enemy into oblivion and break his collarbone. He he asks him for help. Um, he asks him for help and he says, I'm asking you for help because I know there's a good person in you. Like, I know some people are like, well, that's Superman's thing. It's like, no, it's Batman's thing, I think. And, it's, and the, I mean, the reason I feel that way is... Probably because in Poison Ivy because she turns into a murderer. Right, but, right. But Freeze, they give him like the moment of redemption. Right. What's up with the mic over there? <laughs> what are you doing? I love. I love how he also keeps the the serum. He's like, this will save your friend, even though it was worthless to me. I kept it close to me the whole time. Well, it's not worthless to him because he's trying to use that to f- progress his into stage two that's what his wife has so he needs I it guess so. yeah oh his wife has stage two? Oh, okay yeah his wife is stage two and so so that's why bruce is like look our batman's like i'll have her moved so that you can continue to your research on her um in arkham um he goes but uh but you still got to go to arkham because you're you, know, you try to kill everybody but he's like but yeah we're going to use this to cure someone and so get, you have the power to save a life instead of take it. I like that whole speech. And then, yeah, Freeze gives in. He's like, you're right. I want to save people. I don't want to kill anybody. I'm a doctor. Because that's the whole thing with doctors, right? They like they take that Hippocratic oath or whatever. Yeah, they're like, it, it's a kind of a cool redemption story for him where it's like, yeah, you fail. But at the same time, like the thing you really want, you do get in the end because the thing you want is a noble thing. Right. And, right. and that's sort of the interesting contrast because... Freeze doesn't necessarily... He wants revenge because he feels like he can't save his wife and he blames the world for it. But then Poison Ivy is just like, I want destruction. Right. And she doesn't get what she wants because that's not noble. But at the end, Freeze is just like, I just want to like work on saving my wife. Yeah, you can do that. That's cool, man. I got your back. Yeah, you don't have to rob banks and steal diamonds to do that. We got you, bro. I gotta say, when the toys came out for this movie, they were awesome. Because everyone in this movie has like 10 costumes to change into. 
So there was like oh yeah, there was like so many, so many toys. Variums. Yeah, there was so many toys. But they never made a skinny Bane, which was really frustrating. I'm like, how am I supposed to reenact they the scene? Made, what? They never made a skinny Bane toy or a, a Dr. Jason Woodrow uh, toy. And I'm like, how can I recreate this I, amazing scene? This would be so hard to make. A skinny Bane? This would be such small figures. Yeah, I guess. You could make a big Bane toy like to that get comes with... oversized costume to fit on him. Well, no, you just make a skinny Bane toy the and then... piece was giant. Just as a up It was like a bowl. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, so you're just interrupting me to be a jerk. Okay. To be a jerk, exactly. <laughs> hey, look who's alive! Oh, stage one McGregor's is cured. Look at the pink sunlight coming into the room. <laughs> What's the rule on sleeping with our partners, Bruce? <laughs> we go one more one-liner yes <laughs> and people get mad that uh, when Sony puts the last shot of the movie in their trailers this shot was in the trailer for this movie it's a very it's a literally the last shot of the movie I mean it's not a revealing shot though no but it's still the final shot <laughs> That was a cool movie. I enjoyed that. Oh, here, here's Smashing Pumpkins. Um, is this the second version, the slower this one? This is the fast version. Oh, now I hear it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jeep Swenson. Yeah, okay, good. I got his name right there. I, I think I screwed up. Um, well, it's uh, it Mike, yeah. Rapper, if it was, uh, Michael Goff. Or whatever I said. Michael Goff is Alfred. Pat Hingle was Gordon. I, I mixed those two up earlier. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing that rapper. Hold on. There's Jesse Ventura. Oh, yeah, Coolio. You nailed it. Oh, I did get it. Banker. He was the banker? He was the banker. Well, yeah, he is of, of the tournament. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't remember him in a bank. No, he was, that's he who was they... wearing a leather jacket. He was more a bookie than anything, but, yeah. Um, yeah, Coolio. I'm sorry. Yeah, I called him Buster Rhymes. That was a, I was way off. Project consultant. Uh, Bob Kane. That's kind of cool to see. He lived... Uh, I, I can't remember when he passed. If he passed before Batman Begins or if he actually made it to the filming of Batman Begins. I can't remember. Um, but, but yeah, he was he was kind of involved in some of these movies. Some, somewhat. Name only. Credit. Look at that. Mr. Freeze's hairstyle. That Not Mr. Freeze when he was Dr. Freeze because he actually did wear a wig. In God, that, that's cool, man. I'm glad we did this. This was a fun fun uh, movie to watch yeah absolutely and uh yeah if you're out there and you're still listening to this first of all thanks for sticking with us the whole two hours and you know plus time of recording this and um hopefully there wasn't too much of an audio drift uh, i think i think it i think we nailed it because my recording is set at two hours and four minutes right now and i think that's about where we are in the movie so that's pretty good it's kind of funny i was concerned that like i'm watching this on hbo and i think you're watching it from like a like a I don't know, like an Amazon version you own or something. Yeah. So I was curious if there was going to be like a different, like I was going to have a different version than you were. No, because um, there's only ever been one cut of this movie ever, even the made-for-TV versions that get aired. Um, there's only ever been one cut. And uh, yeah, so so I wasn't too worried about that. And they did a re-release of this movie 
a couple years ago that what they did a box set of all the Tim Burton movies on Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, and so now all digital versions, no matter where you get it from, come from that, that Blu-ray edition now. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, this song is called Gotham City. Oh, the miniature shop here coming on. That's kind of cool. I think this song is by R. Kelly. Oh, that didn't age well. No, it's called Gotham City. City of justice, city of love. Which I'm like, that doesn't describe Gotham at all. Yeah, it's not really a city of love and or he, justice. Yeah, he says, he says uh, that he says it's a, a city of peace. I'm like, what city are you talking about? I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? <laughs> Gotham City, oh yeah. It's like the simplest lyrics. Um, someone who <laughs> doesn't know what Gotham City is writing a song about Gotham City. Um, yeah, man, I'm really glad we did this. This was really fun. What And what a movie. Of all the movies we could have watched together tonight, I'm so glad we ended up watching this. Yeah, I know. Like, we could have watched really anything, and I just sort of threw this out there because it sounded fun. And when I suggested it, I was like, oh, do I really want to watch that movie? And now I'm like, that was a great time. I had a fun time watching that movie. We should, um... We should keep the theme going with movies that have Taco Bell um, product placement in it, like this one did. And uh, oh, so we're going Demolition Man next. Yeah, Demolition Man all the way, bro. <laughs> I have that on Blu-ray, man. Like I watch that anytime. Didn't did me, you, and Kevin want? Was that your first time seeing that movie? Demolition Man. Yeah, that was watching Demolition Man with you guys. Where you guys were like, "Oh, you gotta watch it," and I was like, "Okay," and we watched it together. I remember. Um. Demolition Man is one of my favorite '90s movies, and but I like all the stuff that that I think people don't rem, remember about that movie until recently, when I, re, I didn't realize there was such a cult following for that movie until recently. Because um, I think you you let me go to Comic Con with you for like a day a year or two ago, and they did a pop up Taco Bell to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Demolition Man. And I remember being like, what? Like, people remember this movie? Like, because every time I bring it up to people, they go, what's Demolition Man? I'm like, we got to watch it. And then we That's do- the same thing I do. I'm like, oh, have you ever seen Demolition Man? And they're like, no. And I'm like, it's the best movie ever. Yeah, it is. Those are some quick credits, by the way. Yeah, that I was expecting more credits. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my, my, mine's all over. Shit. <laughs> yeah, mine's completely over now. Um. So, Alex, final thoughts on Batman and Robin. I want to hear them. You know, I think it holds up really well. Uh, the effects hold up great in terms of, like, I mean, obviously not everything looks perfect. It's a movie from 1997, so uh, it, it's never going to look like the Avengers Endgame or anything like that. I get it, but using those miniatures and kind of how they designed the set, I think really... I don't know. I really liked it. I thought it was a very interesting movie that I didn't really remember seeing all the way through. So I, I would, I would say I would watch this again. I would say I'm a fan of Batman and Robin. Nice. Yeah. This is this is one of those movies where I remember after I saw Justice League when that came out. Um, uh, that well, I gotta, I gotta preface this now because probably anyone listening in the future, there are two versions of Justice League. I'm talking about the theatrical Joss Whedon version. And I remember walking out of there and laughing and going like, oh, my God, that reminds me of like a modern day Batman and Robin. And someone was like, oh, that's that's really low blow. And I go, well, I don't mean that as a complete insult either, because <laughs> I, I have a fondness for Batman and Robin. Now, granted, I don't think Just League's a good movie. Um, I think Batman and Robin's a better movie, actually. Um, I don't know. Would you agree to that or no? You know, I think I would. I, I would say this is a better movie than a lot of modern movies that I, I think we kind of herald as amazing. I like this better than the Nolan Batman. And, and while I really do enjoy the Nolan Batman, this is this is sort of campy and goofy. And, and while I, again, do enjoy the Nolan Batman, there's a great performances in those, especially by Heath Ledger. This is just fun to watch. Like, I think we both could say we had a great time just kind of goofing around and talking like i really found the set dressing interesting i found that was one of the most interesting parts of this movie so for me personally i get it not everyone but for me personally i would say i i enjoyed this movie more than a lot of other movies i would say it's a good movie i would say i i 100 agree 
and normally I'm I like to play devil's advocate, but I 100% agree with what you just said. I I've seen this movie probably, especially post aneurysm, at least like 20 times at least. Um, I don't get sick of watching this movie. I the Batman movie I hate is Batman Forever with Riddler and Two Face. Um, maybe that's the one we got to do next. Maybe we can. That's fine. I I do not like that movie like not even one percent. Um, so that's fine. We could do that at some point if you want. Watch them we'll in do, reverse. We'll do commentary tracks for every every superhero movie there is. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to go quit my jobs because I have something I have to do now. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we'd have to do Ghost Rider 2, and that would be the hardest one. Oh, man. I just watched the two Ghost Riders recently, too. Um, we, I watched the first one because I was like, oh, I kind of have some nostalgia for that. And I watched it, and I was like, I shouldn't have nostalgia for that. <laughs> like, I love Nicolas Cage, but Christ, that movie is hard to watch. And the second one is even harder. Yeah. It makes less sense. I don't know if you feel this way, but there is another bad superhero movie that i i have a fondness for in the way i have fondness for this one um so if you ever want to watch rise of the silver surfer i'm down oh i totally we could double feature the fantastic four movies okay i'd be down for that that would be fun like i would totally do rise of the silver surfer uh because i mean those fantastic four movies what are they like the first ones made less than 10 years after this like probably like yeah, like eight Seven? years. Eight years, Six? yeah. Yeah, about eight years. Yeah, something like that, eight years. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it kind of like holds the same kind of campiness almost. Yeah, it's funny because the year after Batman and Robin came out, we got Blade, which was a definitely a different kind of comic book movie. But to me, like comic book movies, like The Crow came out a year or so before this one. Or no, two years before this one. So to me, like when people are like, "Oh, comic movies have always been kind of campy in the '90s," I'm like, "Not really," because we had we had a Judge Dredd with Sylvester Stallone in it in the '90s. We had yeah. um, we had uh, you know, The Mask with Jim Carrey, which that was slapsticky, but that was supposed to be. But we had The Crow, which was deathly serious, and we had Blade, which was pretty serious. So to me, like this, oh, Blade, yeah, like a borderline horror movie. Yeah, exactly. So when like when. Time. When people say nowadays, they're like, oh, comic book movies are like all kind of uniform now and there's one style they make. I go, no, there isn't. And there, and it's never been that case because there was a Dolph Lundgren Punisher movie that was really dark and gritty that came out in 1990, you know, which was like the same year that this really cheesy Captain America movie came out. And there's also the, the Thomas Jane Punisher film, which is like uh, right? the 2000s. Which I was a PA really, on. Really? Oh, I forgot you were a PA on that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, they filmed it in Tampa. And, it, and and even for a movie having a comedian of uh, John Panette as one of the one of the co-stars or one of the feature actors, right. it, it wasn't a it wasn't a, a a comedic movie in the slightest. It was not. Um, I mean, it had some levity in it, uh, like when he used the ice cream to make the guy think he was burning him. Like, yeah, and, and like uh, the dark joke at the end when he like puts the landmine in the guy's hand or the grenade, and he's like, "Hey, how long can you hold it out with an outstretched arm?" <laughs> yeah, 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 stuff like that, which were all from the comic books too. But still, it was, it was fun. Um, was it mostly from the Grant Morrison run? No, Gar- Grant Morrison. Never, I don't think he wrote Punisher. Uh, it was Garth Ennis. Garth, oh, what did I say? Grant Morrison? I met Garth Ennis. Yeah, yeah. I, I had two beers and they affect me. <laughs> That's all right. I had no beers and I called Coolio Busta Rhyme, so it's it's fair. Um, well, mine's, mine should, mine's more unexcusable because I'm a big Garth Ennis fan. Like, I, I have stuff signed by him. Um, That's fair. Okay. Um, All right. So I'm gonna we're going to wrap this episode up because we're at the two-hour and 15-minute mark. So, Alex, dude, thanks for being on this episode with me. Thanks for coming up with this idea and... Yeah, we're definitely going to have to do this again at some point. This was a lot of fun, man. I had a great time, man. Thank you for uh, inviting me to, to be on this with you. Sure. And uh, any links that I'm able to share uh, for you, uh, you know, just let me know after the show, and I'll put them in the description box down below if people want to check out yeah, Alex's stuff. I wish I had any. I don't, I don't do anything anymore. I'll if you tr- need accounting, hit me up. If you need it, accounting services. If, yeah, if you need accounting or, you know, wedding video edited, um, yeah, hit them up. I need a wedding video edited. <laughs> get married yeah and, and the person doesn't edit your wedding and you want someone to then call me yeah call alex he'll do that uh for a price 
<laughs> and then um, if you're, uh, I'll put a link down below to the most recent Mad Scientist Party Hour episode that you were on then. Oh, yeah, that would be great. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, everyone out there, thanks so much for listening to the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we'll see you in the future. Peace.